Well, Eric, it's really good to see you again. It's good to see right. you too. And um, you mentioned that you had uh, uh, been able to get most of your questions answered just by listening to videos, but that you thought you would check in, and I, I like that. That's good. Uh, and so now you have a question. Um, you use the word isolation, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll make a small correction to that in, and use the word seclusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the reason for that is isolation has the quality that the crowd is isolating the individual to where in seclusion or in solitary, that's because you've been the one who did the isolating or you're the one who chose to be in seclusion. OK, so uh, uh, the result then is, is that you're in a room with the door closed all by yourself. The question now is who's banging on the door? If you're in isolation, then you're banging on the door trying to get out. And if you're in seclusion, they're banging on the door trying to get in. Do you see my slight little change in, in there to recognize it? OK, because the uh, the seclusion is something that you're choosing to do. If you're choosing to do it wisely. But it's also possible for you to isolate yourself because you don't want them to do it <laughs> or um it, it, well, it again like a fear of rejection right 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 fear of rejection and or other things like that so one of them has uh one of them has the mentality of the winner and the other one has the mentality of the loser. Isolation is what the loser gets and seclusion is what the winner gets. When you see it like that, you might want to change that language. Yeah. OK, so uh, dealing with seclusion now, that's what we're going to start dealing with instead of isolation. Uh, because now is always your choice. And that's the important thing is to recognize that the, uh, the choice that you have is what gives you the power. And when we do things on automatic pilot, that means that we don't really have a choice. We're just taking, um, the instinct rather than reasoning it out. Uh, uh, the difference then I guess would be in isolation, you're running away and in seclusion, you're ambling into. What's the word used? Ambling, walking slowly. Mm. Um. So with that connotation, you also talked about, well, when you're coming out of seclusion, then how do you deal with the people? Because you mentioned about the noble attitude is actually, uh, let us use it for the moment. Uh, in one's own mind, your own noble attitude is better for you than your ignoble attitude because the ignoble attitude has dukkha and the noble attitude has no dukkha. Okay, that's a way of beginning to understand it also is, is that if you get in seclusion and get your mind into a noble state, then what's the likelihood of if you lose, leave the seclusion and come back into the world that it becomes ignoble again? Very likely. OK, so going back to this word better, let's plug in now your word that the noble mind is superior to the ignoble mind. 
Do we agree on that? Okay. However, that's not it at all the same thing that you the noble minded is better than or superior to him the unnoble minded that's an ordinary way of looking at it mm -hmm. the noble way of looking at it is is that he's just as good and just as superior as you are that the noble attitude sees everything as um Let's, let's take and define this this thing that we're talking about for just a minute, this relationship thing, and we'll do it in the sense of um, mathematics. You've probably heard of an equation, and the reason that we have equations is because of the equal sign, and that's very powerful, useful in uh, mathematics, that equal sign, so that you can arrange things around it and both sides are always equal. So you can take this side that's this divided by X and put it on this side and multiply it by X and it's got the same value, you see. So um, in, in that regard, we can uh, understand the basic point that we're looking for then is the noble, what relationship does he have to the other? Because they're not equal. It's clearly they're not equal. OK, what are the other symbols that we can put into the equation? Because we have a greater than sign, we <laughs> have a greater than an equal, we have a less than sign. OK, so this is how we normally think that if it's not equal, it's either greater than or less than. Mm -hmm. OK, but in fact, in mathematics, we have other symbols that are often useful other than that equal or the greater or the less than. And that would be an equivalency sign. Mm -hmm. Right, the things are equivalent, but they're not equal, but they're equivalent. In other words, a 20. Um, a 20 liter bottle of water is an equivalent to a five gallon can of water, but they're not equal. In, in what way are they not equal? Well, because five gallons uh, multiplied by four as if there were four quarts in a gallon, but a liter is not exactly a quart. OK, so roughly the same. Huh? Roughly the same. They're roughly the same. Equivalent. That's what we're getting at. They're equivalent in the sense that if you've got a five gallon can of water in one hand and a 20 liter bottle of water in the other, they're equivalently heavy. So with that understanding now, we can also play with other signs that we would put in there that are not necessarily quite so mathematical and one of the uh, the signs that I would uh, uh, you have useful in there is the the heart symbol <laughs> okay that in fact we can say that we love each other or we can have daggers and arrows between them also uh, in the sense of separation. So uh, this thing then, uh, this equal sign thing, is basically what we're talking about would be the verb that you would use. Okay, mm -hmm. what's your relationship with other people? And mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. superiority is something that the um, victims want to have. Mm -hmm. They want to be better. OK, the noble doesn't care. About that. Mm -hmm. So a noble is going to see ordinary people as just ordinary, even though he is actually superior to them. But if he thinks he is. He's not noble anymore. Mm -hmm. He's ordinary again. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. And so then my next question would be. Uh, in another one of your videos, um, I heard you talking about a tough relationship with a father and you recommended 
uh, at least trying to to be with him like five minutes on, on every occasion. And then if I if I feel like I lose my my sati, then I go back into seclusion and I re reload my my sati. And then Judge. my question, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, would be in general regarding triggers. When you're in social situations, sometimes or many times you don't get to quit after five minutes. So then, um, is I it, didn't hear exactly what you said about five minutes. You get you get fed up like in, in five minutes. In most, is that what? in most social situations, let's say a, a party or a movie or let and anywhere that you're expected to stay for like a couple of hours. And you feel I, I might feel like I get triggered or let's say I get praised and I feel already superior because once I get a praise, I get all, all you know, my, my ego shoots up. And it's not like I can't um, go back to my to my house in that moment. Okay. So then is, it, is it still beneficial to ride that wave or should I aim for a perfect sati and go back home whenever I feel like I'm losing it? When you mentioned a couple of hours and mentioned in the sense of suppose two or forces, it reminds me of our Winner Earhart, who had a, a training back in the 70s called EST. That back in the 70s, they had EST and Life Spring and all kinds of quasi pseudo psychology groups that you would go do a weekend for. OK, mm -hmm. and then they would put you through various uh, 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 jump through various hoops and whatever with the idea that it's going to be good for you mentally. And one of the things that Earhart would do um, at a certain point in his seminar would be that he would lock the doors, telling people that he was locking the doors and saying that they had to stay there for two hours. Can't go to the bathroom just have to put up with it. Well, some people who knew that was coming, they went to the bathroom early. People who didn't know what was going on, they had to put up with it, right? The point is, though, that anyone can stand up and walk out of that seminar and go to the bathroom or take a break or go eat a hamburger or whatever and come back later before the two hours is finished, that no one is forced to stay there. And here you're saying that you're being forced, and I haven't heard anybody being forced to sit two hours <laughs> since the 1970s. So what is this about? <laughs> because um, most social situations, the question is, uh, to start off with, are you standing around other people who are standing around? Or are you sitting and if you're sitting, are you sitting around the way that people sitting around? Are you sitting in chairs that are arranged military fashion, like pews in a church or seats in a theater? What kind of seating do you have there? In other words, does everybody have to point to the direction of the stage where someone's in charge of this? No. Or is it more of a group setting? Yeah, group settings. OK, well, see, you've already proven to me that there is no pressure about a two hour thing that in that group setting, you can walk around, you can move, you can do whatever you want to do. That that uh, thinking that it's a prison is a loser's mentality or a victim's mentality right from the get go. I've got to stay here when in fact you don't. That in fact, what would be um, uh, a way of um, looking at it would be to do something so long as it's comfortable to do. And when it becomes uncomfortable, be aware of that discomfort so that you can do something about it. There are some things that we need to learn to endure. But sometimes the endurance is simply because we can't prevent it. So the first thing we can work on is preventing it. In fact, the Buddha talks about this in one of the suttas where he's saying that we have housing 
a shelter for protection from the sun, from the heat, from the rain. And then they mentioned even uh, mosquitoes or gadflies is what uh, they translate it to uh, and creepy crawly things. And then in another one, it talks about the robes or the, the garments that we wear, the clothing that we wear. We wear that also protection. We wear the clothes for protection from the heat, from the cold, from the uh, from the rain, uh, from the gadflies. OK, but sometimes. Uh, because either the housing or the clothing is not available, we'll still have to endure the heat of the sun. So now we have to endure it or we have to endure the uh, the mosquitoes. So there is a certain amount of endurance that's necessary after we've taken all due precautions. OK. And that uh, so one of the things that we can talk about in just in a silly kind of way is, is that that endurance for that two hours only comes after you check the door to see that it's not locked. In other words, you really don't have to stay there to endure it. And not only that, but we think of this endurance in the teachings of the Buddha. The Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa actually has a very pointed way of looking at it. And that is, is that there are things that we will have to endure. In the beginning, in seclusion, we want to be secluded from the things that we have to endure that are heavy so that we can learn to endure the little tiny things and we get good at handling uh, this moment. I mean, uh, uh, a little kid can get bored really fast, yeah. right? Okay, and the reason for that is because he does not have any qualities of endurance. So endurance is a skill that is to be developed, but we only develop that skill when we need to. In other words, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa talks about it in the sense of that when you are sick, that's an excellent time to practice. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we're going to practice enduring being sick and we can endure it quite handily. Thank you. That in fact, enduring things uh, not so well is the position of the victim and enduring things very happily and easily that's the winner. That's the noble position. So there is a matter of, of, of gaining skills. Of endurance. So what you can say is I hate this place. It's now um, an hour and 55 minutes before I can get out of here. Let me endure it another two minutes and then I'll leave. And at the end of that two minutes, you can say, well, I did two minutes. I can do another two minutes. And then I'll leave. OK, but if you feel trapped, I can't leave. Now you long to leave. You want to leave. And you can't leave because you won't let yourself leave because I mean, you're not really ball and chain to this chair that you're sitting in. <laughs> the door is really not locked often. <laughs> <laughs> then yeah. you do have choices, but the way that we deal with those choices is enduring it in the wrong way, rather mm -hmm. than recognizing I can do this a little bit, and if I can do it well for a little while, maybe I can do it again. And so this is the winner's attitude. Oh, I can handle this another two minutes. Okay, so. Whatever it is, and it may be, in fact, daddy yelling at us. How long can we endure that? OK, many guys can't. They start yelling back. Yeah, but in that case, it's not necessary to to endure it. You can just walk away. Well, that's exactly correct. And in fact, it's quite easy to do in that situation that in fact there's a little trick uh, <clears throat> that uses um, Western society to your advantage. And that is the issue of bathroom habits. 
Mm -hmm. And so you can use, I've got to go to the bathroom as an easy excuse to get out of any situation. <laughs> I'll be right back. I got to go to the can. And while you're in the can, now you can get your mind back into a state of seclusion and you may not have to um, come back into the same room. You can use the, um, the bathroom as an excuse to use another door and just leave. Right? <laughs> so we have an easy excuse to get out of any situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's a whole lot better uh, in the sense that you, um, some people would call this, oh, but that's a lie. And we have in our society the concepts of little white lies because we would tell a lie that is going to, let us say, make the situation or make the dukkha smaller. And by telling the truth, you will make it a lot worse. So you don't tell the dad, oh, I am sick and tired of you yelling at me and I'm out of here. It's not going to be useful or, or helpful. Right, so you don't tell him why you're leaving. You find another excuse for me. But it's OK to walk away from tense situations. It's better to leave them than get stuck into it. The question is, can you stay there and endure it and still have a noble mind? So that's something to play with. So when mm. the first thought, oh, I got to get out of here, let me tell him I'm going to the bathroom, you can say, yeah, but I can wait one minute and endure this a little while and build up my noble endurance. And then I'll in, take a hop. In those cases, what, uh, what red flags are there that point to you when you've crossed the line of playing with uh, endurance as a toy to... Um, making bad thought habits or, or something. I think you're asking the question about how um, our attitude about endurance, the question or uh, the word itself is problematic because um, the word let, endurance. Let me give a little bit more, more context to it. Like okay. for example, what, what you're saying reminds me of the uh, intention, let's say of the long sitting in Vipassana. They don't give you the option of Uh, uh, getting out of the meditation hall, but sometimes I used to have those kinds of thoughts, uh, like I can handle uh, two minutes more, I can handle four more minutes, mm -hmm. and I would think that I was enjoying it, and when I began uh, calling you, I told you that I re remember that as a positive experience, so I fear, <laughs> or I, uh, I think that if I follow this advice right now, I might drift back into that line of thinking again. Which exactly line of thinking you're talking about? That I can't tell the difference between playing with endurance as a toy and uh, making a habit of being tense. Ah, oh, that's what I was about to address. Now I understand um, the question. You were kind of a half a step ahead of me there. Okay, so here's the point. The problem is the word endurance the way that it's used in our language is something that a victim does that he endures something from the outside okay that's a loser's position is endurance the winner has the attitude of oh i'm not enduring this i can handle it this guy has dukkha and i can stand in the presence of the dukkha but he can't hit me he can't touch me okay just we can use the example of being sick because that's a really really valuable one uh but uh but being sick and having the body sick uh has a, a very very similar quality to dad yelling at us we don't like it okay and we don't want to be here and yet you don't have much choice about being sick but you do have a choice about your attitude about how you're going to handle being sick. 
That's the difference. You can't. Uh, so in that case, you're kind of stuck with the endurance, but that's a really excellent time to practice not enduring sick, just being sick. But the problem with the word endurance has to do that that's the mentality of the victim. Mm -hmm. Let me get a, a little bit more subtle, though. Uh, mm -hmm. When talking about mind moments, it's not like uh, black and white that you can say I'm playing with endurance, or in my case, playing with endurance or uh, feeling dukkha with endurance. Right. It's, uh, in other words, like, are you endurance? Are you enduring, which is the dukkha? Uh -huh. Are you playing with it, uh -huh, which is but, the noble? But what I was going to say is that taking into account my moments, I might like play with it for five seconds and then being dukkha for 10 seconds. Like the last time it happened to me, it was in a social setting and it had mm -hmm. to do with jealousy. Not because of an overthink, but because of just subtle things that I noticed that my my girl was liking a friend of mine. And I remember all, all of the videos and stuff, and I took deep breaths, and I said, this isn't really important and stuff, but I was feeling like getting all cramped up. Mm -hmm. In that case, let me ask you, do you think that the tension would melt away quickly if you walked away? Or would you carry that tension, uptightness, and jealousy with you when yeah, you walk away? Kind of, because I would be making a big deal about, about it. Right. Right. Okay, making a big deal out of it. Uh, that, that that's another way of talking about enduring is by recognizing, oh, this thing is a big deal because I've made it a big deal. Mm -hmm. that, that you're jealous and that's a big deal, but you're the one who made the big deal. That she may, in fact, be conscious of what she's doing and is intentionally trying to make you jealous. <laughs> Or she is, um, let us say, not aware of what's going on and doesn't recognize that she's hurting you. Okay, one of the others, but the the reality is, is that she's not hurting you. Reality is, is that you're hurting you. All right, and you're the one who's making that important. So, in fact, you could say that jealousy and being sick and having daddy yell at us basically bring up the same kind of feelings, the feelings of, I don't like this, I want to get away from it. The thoughts that we will have associated with those feelings will be the thoughts that are associated with the situation, but the feelings are basically the same. I hear dogs. Yeah. They're not mine, though. They're not, not your dogs, right? That's what I just figured out. When you shut the door, I figured out not your dogs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's that's the easy way out. Just shut the door. <laughs> you can shut the door on dad. You can shut the door on the uh, the jealousy and the girlfriend. You can shut the door on the. Uh, um, that's the whole point about seclusion: is getting away from it happily. Wow, I don't have to deal with that anymore. Yeah. Now, also, the way that we learn to do that is by doing that inside of our own mind first. This is where we practice, is throwing out the jealousy before the real jealousy, to throw out the barking before the real barking, to throw out um, uh, <coughs> sickness mentally. This is how this is what the, the whole practice in seclusion is all about, that we get off into seclusion so that we can begin to deal with the world. But we begin to deal with the world, not as it, the world. We deal with the world that we brought with us when we came into seclusion. So even though you leave the girl and get away from her, 
you bring the jealousy along. And so now we have to deal with the jealousy itself, whether we're in front of the girl or alone. The jealousy is already there. OK, and so now we can look at it. In fact, jealousy is a whole lot easier to deal with when you're alone. If you know how to deal with it. But it's really hard to deal with jealousy when you're alone if you don't know how to deal with it because uh, you want to get out of seclusion and get back to the girl because you're jealous. So you want to find out what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have that problem. <laughs> Right, so seclusion doesn't do you any good if you bring the jealousy with you. But it can do you some good if when you're looking at that jealousy, you can talk yourself out of that jealousy. You can drop it. You can become king of that jealousy or you can become the emperor of that pile of dirt. That's the change of attitude of, oh, I see you. That's the aha, uh -huh, I see you, Myra. Aha, uh -huh, I see you, jealousy. Aha, uh -huh, I see that disgust. And by being able to see that, we're actually slowing things down. Now, uh, I've just um, seen, it's been out for a while. It was on the bestseller, and the guy who wrote it, uh, a psychologist, actually has a Nobel Prize, but I think it's in economics but he's a psychologist. It's kind of a humorous little thing. And um, what we're talking about here, uh, his terminology is slow thinking versus fast thinking. All right, I haven't seen it. Right, so you already know what we're talking about here. Uh, okay, I, I so did you read the uh, article that I put on? Uh, no, I, I just uh, glanced at it, but I haven't watched the whole thing. OK, well, let's talk about it for a little bit because he's looking at something. In fact, I am really amused and surprised that uh, the, the psychologist and the neuroscientist are now beginning to put together the way that the mind works that the Buddha knew about all along. But now we've got a new metaphor or a new way of describing it. New language. OK. The problem with the uh, with the neuroscientist is, is he doesn't know how valuable his in new information is because he has found the problem, but not the cure. OK, that he thinks that in fact that he's figured out what fast thinking is, but he doesn't recognize that there's a there is a way to change it. And so the, um, the jealousy then is basically fast thinking um, uh, in the sense that it's instinctual. We instinctively get um, jealous. We instinctively look at her with this other guy and we immediately put two and two together. But we but what I mean by that is that we're not really observing what's really going on. We're adding something to it. What are we act, adding to it is something out of our past. Well, um, the guy who was doing the. Um, uh, the past thinking came across something very amazing. And that is, is that when we are confronted with a new situation, a new problem, uh, a new event that we don't know the answer to, what we will do instead is make a very quick, like a tenth of a second substitution with another problem that is similar. And then we will give out the solution to that problem. In other words, um, um, one of the, by the way, one of the places that jealousy starts is with siblings, sibling rivalry, sibling jealousy. People who are uh, raised as a, as a single person generally does not experience jealousy nearly as much as as uh, uh, <clears throat> people who, as children, were raised with siblings. Do you have any sisters or brothers? No, I was raised an only child. 
<clears throat> okay, so you're lucky now because your jealousy is not nearly as strong. <laughs> but there were things in, in your childhood that you did have jealousy over, that that kid did get your sandwich, or he did do better in school than you did, and you felt bad. So what happens when we see the girl with the guy, we bring up a similar situation and then feel the way that we used to feel rather than inspecting and choosing to feel we want the way uh, the way that we feel now. That's it is that the jealousy that you're experiencing when you uh, visibly with your eyes see she and him together, the jealousy comes up because you're not in the present moment. What in fact you see in the present moment in your mind is perhaps them kissing, hugging, taking their clothes off. I don't know what you've got in your mind. <laughs> but the reality of the situation is she's just talking to him and probably has a two foot distance. And in your mind, you bring that distance down to zero. All right. And that's what we do. And that happens very, very quickly in the mind. Yeah. But if you know that process, you can stand there and watch her and watch him with observation <clears throat> and recognize that actually she is indeed keeping her distance. It may only be two feet, but she doesn't have her hands all over his body. So there's no reason to get jealous yet. Not reason to get, but we get jealous quickly because that's what we see in the mind, right? Mm -hmm. When you see her standing and talking to him and they're two feet apart, the jealousy brings them closer together than they actually are. You create yeah, I'm not, the I'm not even. I'm not even imagining anything. I just don't like that she likes him. And uh, the feeling is direct and it comes up and you don't even know the connection that you've made. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's when we need Sati. Walking out of the room is not going to give you Sati. But if you have Sati in a situation, uh, the wise thing to do may be to walk out of the room. That in fact, if they are smooching, hugging, kissing, and undressing each other, that's the time to walk out of the room. Give them some <laughs> privacy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, basically, that that closeness that you put together with them together in your mind didn't actually exist. And it happens so quickly in the mind, you didn't even notice it. You just went from there like this into feeling bad. When in fact, the reality of the situation is not dangerous at all. The danger was something that you added to it. Yeah. You did that based upon your past. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, the slow thinking then is the slow thinking of we're going to do is wait a minute let's take another look but slow down take a deep breath and start observing what's going on rather than uh instantly imagining the worst possible scenario and in fact that imagining the worst possible scenario happens so fast that now you're claiming that it didn't happen at all <laughs> to where in fact it did happen and you missed it that and uh, and that w what you missed was the what if thing that we did i see them like that and the what if and now we feel bad to where that didn't happen it was a what if in the mind i'll be more mindful about it next time 
Ah, yes. So this is what our practice of Anapanasati is, is to start watching these very, very fast things that we're doing in the mind that gives us almost instantaneous results that are often wrong. Now, it's right enough that it keeps us alive that I mused when I was really studying psychology and really beginning to understand what was going on in the world, I was constantly surprised that certain people in my life weren't dead already <laughs> from clutching themselves to death. I mean, I've known people who I can't imagine that they can live 24 hours because they're so incompetent at what they're doing that they would naturally kill themselves, and yet they don't. Somehow they survive it. How is That's that? Nice. The answer is, is that that instantaneous stuff that we do actually is a survival mechanism. Survival. And uh, in our uh, genetic history, way back when, that kept us alive. In other words, when we're there, uh, uh, let us say the otter sitting on the bank, that when that alligator springs out of the water directly into the air, all we see is the mouth and the teeth of that alligator, that should be enough for the otter to say, I've got to get out of here. And he turns and he goes instantly, right? Because the otter can make the connection between the teeth of the alligator and him being in those teeth. And so he moves, okay? This is the survival mechanism. We were raised in a jungle in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You, you can see this. In fact, I, I enjoy watching animals uh, deal with each other, like a mongoose and a, uh, uh, a cobra. And in fact, I've even seen ducks take on heavy snakes. Because the duck, uh, because the snake was after the baby, right? And so animals deal with each other, and that they, they deal with them instinctively. But our society, our society is much, much more complicated. Humans are complicated kinds of things. Those instinctual behaviors that we have of just jumping out of the way of the alligator that's flying through the air or jumping out of the way of the snake that's spitting his venom at us or jumping out of the way of the cobra striking is an, a survival instinct. And that's also a skill that can be developed so that some people can actually keep snakes in a basket and then uh, play a little horn while the snake is coming out of the basket and they know how to keep the snake charmed so that the snake doesn't bite him. But if the bite, if the snake tries to bite him, he's already prepared for that and he's going to react very fast. So he's watching. He's watching closely. OK, the reason I'm talking about this is because I want to give you the point that our very, very fast reaction time, our instinctual behavior has kept us alive individually and as a society to grow up into a society that's too complicated for that mechanism to work all the time correctly. It doesn't. In fact, it only happens about half the time. That gives me back to that point about some people are so stupid because they're so instinctual <laughs> that I'm, I'm surprised that they can survive. Half the time is a good score. I thought it was less. Pardon? Half the time is a good score. I thought it was less. <laughs> well, we can increase it. But in fact, half the time is the, is the way that the victim lives his life. We can increase that quite a bit by reprogramming some of these instantaneous behaviors. Just like musicians that are going to learn a technically fast detailed, difficult passage. He's not going to practice it up to speed over and over again wrong until he starts getting it right. We don't do it that way with music or getting that technical passage. We have to slow it down, watch our fingering, make sure that we're getting every note, 
and the tempo is unimportant. Getting the fingering and the technique and the notes correctly over and over and over and over and over again. And most kids, when they're practicing piano, they want to play it up to speed all the time to where the right way to learn the passage is by slowing it down. We do the same thing in karate with the katas, the slow movements. Also, the same thing is with Tai Chi. Zen and the art of archery, many, many different things we learn by slowing it down and getting it right. And that's exactly how we're going to work with Anapanasati is to slow things down, look at what we're doing and getting it right over and over and over again. And we're going to train new neurons. And we build new neurons. Now, somebody just posted something that says that it takes about 400 re redos over and over and over again to build a new synapse. Unless you like what you're doing, and if you really like what you're doing, you can get that down to about 20 different repetitions before it becomes automatic. But we can program that automatic pilot. That was something that I hadn't figured out before until this guy came by, and that's when it dawned on me. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing is that we're reprogramming with the conscious frontal cortex, getting it right. And then over and over again, training the reptilian brain. So that when it does do its fast response, it's going to increase its average above 50%. Okay, so let us say then that the, the, your girlfriend talks to a guy and about half the time that's okay. And about half the time you get jealous. <laughs> okay. So if you practice watching this jealousy as it arises and recognize that, oh, she's just standing there with him, analyze the situation, look clearly at what's going on, you can recognize there's no need for this jealousy and I can put it aside. You may need to do that 400 times before you can easily put it aside. But you can train yourself out of jealousy. Now, the thing about jealousy is, is that we do jealousy stuff all the time. Why? Because we compare ourselves to others on a regular basis. This is part of the instinct. We instinctively go around comparing ourselves to others. We could go so far as to say that's the root foundation of a competitive society. This is why we have wars, we have conflicts, we have arguments, is because we will take a position daring somebody to disagree with us often. Because we like the competition. And the competition almost always has two possible outcomes, win or lose. The thing that we don't understand is, is that instinctively, we set up that competition with our own set of criteria. In other words, jealousy is preordained because you're comparing yourself to an unknown quantity, but you're putting yourself down. What if you saw her talking to a, a stud and you just automatically had to thought, oh, she'll be finished with him in two minutes because she really prefers me. I'm the better hu human. OK, but you don't you think, oh, no, she's talking to him. I'm going to lose. In other words, we are predisposed in our um, uh, competitions for victimhood. Once you start practicing correctly, you begin to, to see that you're setting up the criteria for every competition. And you set it up either to win or to lose based upon your criteria that what she's doing and what he's doing have nothing to do with your competitive spirit. You're the one who is competing with him and he doesn't even know it. And not only are you competing with him, you're losing. And he doesn't even know that. And we did all of that in our own mind. And it happened yeah. that fast. Yeah. Uh-huh. So 
If we can see those things happening like that, we can begin to program it into being a winner. I can handle that. I'm better than he is anyway. And so we start to reframe our competition so that we always win. You're always a winner. It doesn't matter what situation happened. You won this one. Because you know how to set up your competitions. You know how to set up your uh, criteria for what is winning and what is losing. But I mean, I'm not noble yet, so I can't. If I thought that I'm better than he is, then that would be um, egotry. How do you call it? Like um, lying to myself, you know? Pardon? Is that I'm not, um, let's say, at your level yet, or at a good meditator's level yet, that I can declare myself noble, you know? So if I think to myself... Ah, but declaring yourself noble is not the point. The point is, is are you behaving, or are you feeling, or are you in the attitude of a noble? And often it's the victim who declares that he's a noble. Okay, but then Brother. let's say like uh, if noble minds don't compare, then how can noble minds say I'm better than him? Well, that's the point that I'm making. Okay, so you're really along with me. So let's continue along with this because this is basically the noble in training. The noble in training, first thing that he begins to do is to change his attitude that I can handle this. I'm the winner here. Okay. Along the way, he will step into the pile of crap because, and I am better than other people. All right. That's what we're getting at. That's the problem is, is that we see ourselves better than others. But if you recognize that you were setting up the competition in the first place so that you do win. And because you win every time <laughs> we begin to recognize, well, what's the pe reason for competing with these people? Because I'm going to win on every occasion. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, that's the, why should I bother competing with him? I already know the outcome. I'm going to win. <laughs> I set up the competition that way. <laughs> and he can come into the same situation with his own set of criteria, and he may win or lose. But that's and if we fun. come, but can both can come in to the, to the situation and both wind up winners, it wasn't much of a competition anyway, and that's what we're looking for doing is to beginning to figure out how we can set it up so that everybody wins this competition, that it doesn't have to be a winner or a loser anymore. Okay, so we take these greater than and less than kind of signs that we're looking for in the competition. Competition does not like a tie. You don't like a tie. Look at it in the way that they do baseball. They have extra innings. They want a winner here. How about football with a sudden death match or something like that, okay? That's the whole point is, is that we want in our society winners and losers. Because then the situation will prove that I'm a winner. And nobody goes into that competition recognizing that they're a winner or loser based upon the criteria. An example of that would be, um, let us say the cheerleader on one side is, is making uh, advancements for one of the football players on the other team. For her, who wins that football game is irrelevant. because she's got other things in mind. She's got another criteria that she's playing. So when she's at that football game, she's not watching the scoreboard. She's watching that player out on the field and to see if he's going to look at her too. Okay, so this is what I mean by uh, everyone sets up their own set of criteria to win or to lose. And the, big, and the whether we win or lose depends upon our attitude. So the so the losers, the victims always choose a set of criteria so that they feel the loser. 
And many times if the loser will actually win and everybody in the room, including the guy that you won against, will agree that you won the argument, but the victim still feels victimized. He doesn't feel like the winner because he's using a different set of criteria than the other people. All right. Would you recognize that these criteria that we choose on how to deal with a situation comes up instantly? It comes up out of our past. It comes up out of our instincts. But if we could slow things down, we can look at this competition and say, wait a minute, let me wisely choose the criteria for this contest. And if I wisely choose the criteria for the contest, then we will both wind up winning this contest. But like I said, that's only an intermediate stage. Eventually, what's the point of having these contests <laughs> that we don't compete or, uh, anymore? There's no reason to. Now, let's go back to the point about the winning and losing, because these are the words then that come up in the poly, and that has to do with pride and jealousy. Actually, there's two kinds of jealousy. There's what we call jealousy, and the other one is envy. Okay, so in the situation of the triangle that you're mentioning, your girlfriend, that guy, and you, in that situation, you're being jealous because he's honing in on your territory and he feels envious of you because he, you have something he wants. OK, so one is the sense of approaching and the other one is the withdrawing. In other words, he's encroaching upon my territory. And so my jealousy is, is that I'm losing something. And his approach is, I'm going to gain something, and so he has the envy. All right, so these are the two words. But envy and jealousy are always what the loser is doing. The other side of what the loser does is set it up so that he can be prideful. Oh, I did win. But here, that's also done ignorantly because he doesn't know that he was the one who set up the criteria for him to win anyway. And so we gloat. Mm -hmm. OK, there was an experiment that was done and has been repeated many times in many different ways. One of them, uh, in fact, the one that was the most horrific was the psychologist group. This, uh, the, the leaders broke it into two groups. And, he, and they had, a, a, let us say, an hour session once a day for two weeks. And these, this group of people came together. These uh, students were prison guards, and these guys were prisoners. And they looked at the personality changes that these role models had so that the bullies who are, are the prison guards will wind up making all the people in the, in the prison guards a bunch of bullies. There's another one that's very similar to this, and that is that they play a game of Monopoly with people playing uh, the game with, let us say, matched like four and, and uh, two players and two players or, you know, that kind of thing. Except that at the beginning of the game, they make a change in the rule. And that is, is that at the beginning of the game, we make a coin cost. And whoever wins the coin toss now gets to use both dice. And the ones who lost the toss only get to use one dice on the game of Monopoly. So naturally, the guys who have two dice are going to go around the board a lot faster. They're going to get land on a lot more property. They're going to buy more property. And then the student who is doing that begins to get arrogant. <laughs> he begins to get prideful and they don't even remember then that the that it was set up that way from the very beginning that you were set up to be a prison guard or a prisoner top dog little dog or you were set up with that uh the dice that uh it was guaranteed who was going to win why do the people who are winning when they were guaranteed to win still bring this pride up and get arrogant and uh, uh, condescending? 
mm-hmm. when they're winning, when in fact their winning was based totally on a set of chance. The toss of a coin determined the game. Because... A lot of cowboy movies are about this too. The winning and the losing based upon one little event that means basically nothing. That's what gambling is really all about, is gain, is putting a great deal of um, power, energy, uh, emotional states on the, uh, the flip of the dice. Well, how many billions of flips of dice have happened in the past? What difference does another dice make unless I put skin in it? Okay. That's Which the answer. Exactly Huh? Is that the answer? Yes, that's that's looking at it. Okay, so the skin in the game that you're putting, because you could see the girlfriend and that guy, but you don't put any skin in the game as if she just saw two people talking. If you, if you see just two people talking, you've got no skin in the game. You see girlfriend and this guy talking, and then now you're putting skin in the game. You're setting up criteria. And this but happens you, you, really fast. That phrase confuses me because you've used it other times as something good, like putting skin in the game in Anapanasati. Right, exactly, because we put skin in the game in all kinds of things in unwholesome ways. Now with Anapanasati, we're putting some skin in the game in a wholesome way. Because we're doing it deliberately and we're doing it with what this guy uh, is talking about, slow thinking. In other words, we're looking at it, we're working it out, we're doing it deliberately. And another way neuro-linguistically we can talk about, or neuroscientifically we can talk about, that we're, instead of making our decisions from the um, uh, reptilian brain or the mammalian, uh, or the, um, the anterior cortex, that we actually bring it to the frontal cortex, slow it down, make every step by step, figure it out, do that over and over and over and over and over and over again, and that begins to program the the anterior cortex so that the anterior cortex can be trained. It got trained. We trained it when we were little kids. We just trained it with the, the information and the data that we got from our parents and they were unhappy. So we wind up being unhappy. But you can reprogram and retrain your mind into happiness by, again, putting the skin in the game, but we do it um, with knowledge. We do it with investigation. We do it by inspection. And all of this has to do with firing up that frontal cortex and looking at things the way that they really are, rather than looking at it, uh, let us say, with the uh, the eye of fear. The eye of fear is the instantaneous. You see them two, two together, and immediately the fear in the mind will bring them together in a way that they actually are not together. We make that connection. We put him and her together in our mind, and they're not even having that. They don't, she sees her here and he sees himself there, and you're the one who sees them like this. How did you make that connection? How did you do this in the mind? Okay, that's what we begin to look at is, is that how do we put this stuff together? How do we set up our competitions? What criteria are we using for the selection for losing that game and feeling bad about it? Because really, you haven't lost anything just because she's talking to somebody. In fact, she may five minutes later skip back over and say, hey, I just got you a job for a million dollars a month. (laughs) Or something like that, you know? You don't know what they're doing, but you're in your mind bringing them together because of the sense of fear Mm -hmm. that we are driven by fear and that fear molecule in there someplace brings them together and that's where the jealousy comes from and you don't even know that you set that criteria up yourself that you did this 
bringing them together, and you did it in one mind moment, a tenth how of a second. We, how do we exactly set up criteria? Like, what's the mind moment we do it? We do it because we're uh, using the data out of our past. We're using failure. We failed as a child. We were um, victims. We messed up often. And we continue to expect to fail. And so when you see girlfriend and a stranger, we that instinct of failure, that instinct of danger will pop into place. And it's inappropriate because it's not really what's going on. Mm -hmm. That the world that humans live in now is much, much more complicated than it was that in 100,000 years ago. Or let us say that if we were chimpanzees and uh, I was the big dominant male and I see one of my favorite females talking to a young male or, or chatting or going closer, basically what they do in that case is he's, he's going to go take ticks and fleas off of the female. That's what the monkeys do. They actually do come together. They're not screwing yet. But the big monkey, as soon as he sees them come together, he's going to go whoop, and he's going to start hammering on and beating up that guy and proving to him that he's the dominant male in this little tribe here. One of the things, by the way, on that side note is, is that when the head male, when the big monkey is in the tribe, there is no sex going on. When that big male leaves the tribe to go hunting or off in seclusion or whatever like that, that tribe, there's a whole lot of monkey business going on. Okay, that actually uh, is part of our past. We still have those kind of genes from our past left over, ready to spring into action within a mind moment, tenth of a second. That's so uh, when meditators uh, start to practice meditation, they only get a glimpse of and eventually they begin to really see the reason why it has to be repeated over and over and over again is because we've got a, a million years of repeating the wrong thing over and over and over again. And it's really, really ground in right down into our genes. And and it is a marvelous thing that this human reptilian brain is often half the time correct, even in this complex society that we live in. But 50-50 is not really satisfactory. We feel dissatisfied. So what we need to do then is to practice getting ourselves into a state of satisfaction so that you can be satisfied and when you are satisfied and now you can use that frontal cortex and really look at what's going on as opposed to operating instinctively or operating with fast thought operating in survival mode that in fact that fast thinking is survival mode uh that that mongoose had better jump out of that way really uh, out of the way really quick when that snake strikes. OK, we take that same attitude and mentality into the test, the SATs, the graduate record exams, the uh, uh, final exams in school, our pop quizzes, that mentality is there. Oh, no, something dangerous, this test. I better get to work. I better get it quick. We get agitated. We get in a hurry because we can't take a test quick, but we've got this instantaneous stuff going on. This part of the survival mechanism. That's why it's so valuable just to slow things down. That I know what I'm talking about here because I was really driven in um, uh, in a hurry. All the time. I remember that I got in a hurry because my dad walked past and it was hard for me to keep up with him. And he kept saying, come on, catch up. 
and he just didn't understand that I was a little kid, you know. He just wanted to walk the way that he normally walked. And uh, to give you an idea about what how he walked, he was a meter reader. His job was meter reading. <laughs> and he was good at it, which <laughs> meant that uh, he could walk faster than the dogs. <laughs> and he wanted me to keep up. So yeah. here I am now in high school taking an algebra pop quiz test. And I've got to be the first one up there. And I remember this happened. This is so funny. I, we have 10 questions. I answer all of the questions, get them correct, pass, hand the paper up, uh, and was the first one to get it on the desk. Everybody noticed that because I made a big trot of getting that paper, you know, because he didn't just say time and everybody hand the paper in. No, I've got to get it first. And I go pop it up on the <laughs> desk. I go back and sit down in my uh, um, uh, seat and review the board and recognize that I'd done one of them wrong. So I hop up, go okay. back up and grab my paper. Now everybody in class is laughing at me. <laughs> and now I got to go get that paper, make that change to it and get it back in first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why did I put myself into that kind of position? Uh, What's wrong? With me putting my paper in in the middle of the time when everybody else is putting their paper in. Why can't I put my page in last? Because yeah. how soon you put the paper in didn't have anything to do with the grade, but it had to do with the criteria and the competition that I set up in my own mind. Mm -hmm. And my competition was based upon speed. How fast can I get that done? So naturally, that same mentality, by the way, is when I walk out of that classroom, I go get on my biggest motorcycle in town. Because <laughs> I'm the fastest dude in town. <laughs> in my own mind, you see. All right. So when we recognize that we do set up our own criteria like that, then we begin to understand what's the point? When I really look at this fast behavior that I'm in the habit of doing and, and detail and watch the events, I can, we can begin to make changes and we can reprogram it and reprogram it so that every time that I get in a hurry, I'll recognize I'm in a hurry and I'll stop and relax. And the last vestiges of that that I have seen was uh, when people would come to visit me here on the island and I would go pick them up at the port. Getting into the truck and going to the port with someone waiting on me there and I'm going to burn down the road. Everybody on that road better look out because <laughs> I'm going to be going this way. I'm going to get there as fast as I can. Why? Because of all this anxiety. But if I can sit down in the truck and recognize that I'm about to drive the truck and I hear all that anxiety comes, let me take a deep breath and moment by moment operate this truck slowly, knowing that if the anxiety for speeding back up comes, I can handle it. And it still comes up, by the way, when I'm uh, uh, with a passenger with Tam, because Tam is a, I mean, she's really excellent in this regard. She's so slow. I could walk to town faster than she drives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you hear that anxiety in that voice? I mean, that whole thing, I can walk fast. No, I can't walk faster than she can drive. That's just delusional thinking again. But it's coming out of that state of anxiety of being in a hurry. We got to get there. You got to go. All right. So this is one of the primary drivers that we all have. I just had that one lickety split. I mean, that was a big one for me. Other people have uh, getting going along to get along is their primary driver. Going along to getting on. Doesn't matter what the problem is. I'll go do it with you because I'm afraid that if I don't do what I'm told to do, I'll get fussed at. So these are some of the things that we do and we build that stuff up as childhood and it comes up fast in the mind. Because it's right there on top. And I call this stuff the sewer. Because it's all out of the past and it's inappropriate. It stinks 
and we keep using it anyway because we haven't bothered to train the mind to do it better. This is why we want seclusion, so that we can go off into seclusion and in this regard with the jealousy, to start musing over the jealousy, to begin to recognize that, oh, I didn't catch them in bed. They were at a distance. They weren't holding hands. They weren't kissing. I did all the kissing in my own mind. I put them together. And when we recognize that, we can say, okay, well, if I put them together and felt bad, maybe if I can take them apart in my mind, I'll feel better. <laughs> <laughs> rather because, just leave it untouched. Because you have that, um, let us say, this is, this is your life, this is your job, if you have the, the, the loser's mentality, then you're going to lose. Or guess what? Most breakups happen. If the guy is jealousy, the relationship is going to break up, not because she wanted another guy, it's because she can't handle his jealousy. The jealousy is what's going to break the relationship, not her talking to another guy. And so if you recognize all this jealousy that I have is dangerous stuff. I could lose this girl by feeling that way. When she's not even giving me anything to feel that way, I invented that myself. And so this is the slow thinking is to look at the detail, look at it closely, investigate closely. And what I mean closely, recognize that we're adding. We're adding stuff to the situation. We're adding the jealousy. The jealousy is not there on its own. We brought that in and we brought it in out of fear. So let's examine that fear. That in fact, if you were completely free from fear in this moment, not completely fear all the time, but in this moment, completely fear, free of fear on top of the world. And then you glance across the room and notice that they're talking. Because you're feeling fearless, the likelihood of you feeling jealous right then and there is quite remote. The jealous is going to come up because the fear is already in the mind. That it visits often. Start to look at during the day how many times fear comes up for you. And start every time that you can see the fear, you can tell yourself, oh, wow, I'm glad I saw that because there's really nothing to be afraid of. And in fact, the thought that I had made me afraid. The thought of dealing with someone makes me afraid. I'll give you an example of that that just happened today. I've got a, uh, an SSD that was defective. And so I arranged with the guy that I brought it from and the, to return it. What was uh, that? Oh, I remember. Right. Yeah, well, an, uh, right. Uh, uh, you know, an, uh, an HSD, a hard disk drive, an SSD is a solid state drive. It's got no drive in it because it's got no platter, it's all of that, it's all electronics. We put it in the back, we got everything going, ready to put in, and the guy sitting in the uh, um, the post office says, oh, there's a magnet in here. We do not allow magnets. Well, I know that, we, that magnets are set in the mail on a regular basis, probably as many as a million a day, and in Thailand, maybe only 100,000, but every hard drive, I mean, how many times to, uh, anything that's got a motor in, it's got magnets in it. And they send electric fans through the mail. They do, I mean, there's just magnets all over the place. This guy's sitting here, oh, well, this has got a magnet in it. And so we can't send it. Guess what? SDDs have no magnets. <laughs> so Tam comes home and she's all flustered because she doesn't like the situation anyway. And so I take a magnet and I prove to her that this SSD has no magnets in it, but a similar size and similar shaped hard drive does have magnets in it. And we can find them with this magnet. 
and I show her how to do that. Okay, so now she's going to go back to the post office, but she doesn't want to deal with the guy. She doesn't want to do this because she thinks he's already made up his mind. And I told her, no, if I can show you that this has got no magnet, then you can show him that it's got no magnet. And finally, she did it. She came back with a big smile on her face and the receipt. He took it. (laughs) (laughs) But she didn't want to go back because she didn't want the hassle. She was going into the situation as a loser. That she had been told no, and now, and see, that's part of the Thai society. In Western society, I don't take no for an answer until I can prove that it's an answer. And when it's proven to be correct, then we take it as evidence rather than as hearsay. So that's another thing about being careful about listening to people. Don't take what people tell you. We in our society have been trained that you're supposed to be honest. And little children who are supposed to be honest because they're told to be honest, they make a very, very vital mistake. Because I hear that I'm supposed to be uh, honest and truthful when I grow up. I will be honest and truthful like everybody else. And so we expect that when we're told something, that it's the truth. The Buddha makes sure to understand, no. Everything has to be investigated. Don't take anybody's word for it. If he says that's magnetic, don't just say, okay, we're going to lose the $50 because he won't take it. No, we take it back there with a magnet to prove to him there's no magnet there. All right, we do not, but in the Thai society, oh, you're supposed to take what you're told. In the Western society, we're supposed, if you go to an official and he told you no, you're supposed to accept his no. All right, that's the thing. But the Buddha says, don't take it because it's part of tradition. Don't take it because your teacher said so. Don't take it because everybody believes it's true. Don't take it because the postman said there's a magnet in there. Don't, I mean, just just don't believe people that the real way of looking at it is everybody, including me, is a liar. And we are lying all the time. Don't trust anything. Verify. And trust. You know, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Reagan says trust but verify all right what he's really saying is i'm being polite by saying trust but i don't i'm going to verify instead (laughs) you have to verify you have to check it out you have to investigate it and so this is what we're actually going to be doing with the slow thinking the slow thinking is investigation the past thinking is just taking what happened on the surface without doing the investigation. So this is what we have to do. We have to start investigating, investigate the situation, investigate how we feel, investigate to find the fear. If you can see what you're afraid of, then you know how to handle it. So be sure that you're investigating. This is the whole quality. The, the point is, of now are we going to go into, in the sense of um, going back to the beginning? We have to do the investigation in seclusion as it builds up as a skill. And as we build that skill of investigation up, now we have to take it into the world so that we investigate everything that happens in the world also. Investigate, investigate, investigate. And see, that's what happened when you saw the the guy and your girlfriend together. You didn't investigate how you felt. You just felt jealousy. Right? I mean, and I, it I, came I tried quick. To. Pardon? I tried to. You tried what? Um, I tried an anapanasati, but oh. I just kept 
not liking what I felt instead of and wanting things to change right away. Oh, yes. Instead of saying, um, well, the part of the investigation would be she's not touching him. She is not advancing on him. He is not advancing on her. But that's how I feel. I feel like that they're encroaching upon my territory, but they're just standing there. So the investigation uh, then with the positive thoughts would be I can handle them just standing there. Let me take a deep breath and I can handle at least this much. I can't handle when she moves in on him, but I can handle it right now. Mm -hmm. Investigate the description I make of the event and what that implies and how I might change that description. Right. Investigate both the inside and the outside. Investigate the outside to see that they're not that close together. They're not that close together. They're not that close together. They're mm -hmm. this close together. This is the reality of it. So that's the first thing that you have to do is you have yeah. to see the reality of the situation. So you have to reinvestigate it. Then you have to investigate also the inside. Where is the fear? Mm -hmm. Do I feel fear? Can I breathe into that fear and relax it? Because that distance between them indicates there's nothing to be afraid of. The reality of the situation is that there's nothing to be afraid of. And I'm so happy that I can see that. <clears throat> I can really see my own jealousy. Wow, that's great. And so we begin to change our feelings and attitudes. You feel good. You feel like the winner because you can see your jealousy and how dangerous it is and how your feelings of fear interfere with your life. But this is what we call a false positive and the um, uh, the the instinct is actually the reason why we do survive with this 50% level is because uh, the error is almost always in the positive direction in the sense of a false positive. The alarm goes off when there's no uh, fire. The air raid warning sounds when there's no air raid. And that's good. It's a whole lot better then the air raid happens, but there was no air raid, no air raid siren. The fire happened, but there was no fire alarm. That's called a false negative. The false negative is, is that you've got a problem, but you don't know it. But our instincts have been set up to training that it responds with false positive. In other words, our instinct for self-preservation goes off too often. And that was an example of it. You saw him and her standing together and the fire alarm went off and there was no fire. And when your heart's on fire, burning with desire, smoke gets in your eyes. That's the song, by the way. I like it. It's a really cute song. Okay. And what we need instead of that fire burning with desire, smoke getting in our eyes, we need to have that alarm go off. Look at that, the fact that we've got, we're burning up inside, that we're, we've got this jealousy. Let's, the, but the jealousy was a false alarm anyway. Because there was really no problem. There was no danger. You didn't lose her. She was not kicking you in the ass and kicking you out of her life just because she was talking to a guy, but that's how we feel. So investigate that many of the fears that we have are false positives. The Tam's dealing with the postman was mostly all in her own mind. Because if you put, show them to him, if you show him the magnets <laughs> and show him that there's no, he's going to understand it. You got to prove it to him. But she expected him to be in the same emotional mess that she was in. In other words, she didn't want to hear it when I pointed out to her that there's no magnets in here. She was all frustrated and everything. But that was last night. This morning, she actually did the test herself. 
And so with that doing the test herself, now I know that she can go to the postman and show him the test to show there's no magnet in there. And she proved that she was right. OK, so this is the whole point about the false positives. She's afraid that she can't talk the guy into it. And so she does the examination herself. And now she feels confident that she could prove that there's no magnet in that SSD. That was, by the way, a very interesting thing that I did last night because I took a whole bunch of drives to see what I could find. Well, you can act, uh, hard drives, soft okay. drives, uh, SSDs. I've got four or five SSDs and <laughs> maybe 40 or 50 hard drives, but uh, always looking at just the smaller ones because these are uh, two and a half. Didn't do it on the big, big drives because I know they've got magnets in them and I know exactly where they are. But I showed Tam where they were on the small hard drive because it's got a motor in it and it's got actuator arms and all of that kind of stuff that's in real hard drives. But SSDs don't have any of that kind of stuff. Even the outside case looks like metal, but it's not. It's plastic to where the hard drives are metal. They have to be because you need the strength of the metal for the base in order to handle the torque of the motor coming up. So this this hard drive here has an actual metal case to it. And you've got, in fact, here's the magnet that we're looking at that's sticking right there on the motor. So I've got a motor with a magnet sitting right on it. But there's another magnet right up here that I can find. That's the actuator arm that you could actually see there on the back of it. But the important point that I'm making now is, is that the drive case is metal because it has to stand the torque. But the uh, SSD is in a plastic case, has nothing to it. Does not have any torque, no motors, um, nothing like that. And so they use very little current. They last a long time to where the hard drives, because of all the mechanical stuff in it, that stuff wears out. But the point is, is that we need to do these investigations rather than taking people's word for it or taking our own word for it. This is the real teaching of the Buddha. We got to look and look and pick things apart and check it out and find out that all oh, this jealousy is based in fear. And there's nothing to be afraid of, that that's a false positive, that we feel fear on a regular basis, that the, uh, that in fact, you could say that many times the false positives keep us alive. It keeps us careful, but it keeps okay. us afraid. It keeps us unhappy and dissatisfied, but it keeps us alive. I think what's more like it takes longer is to really make the connection between that between or that fear is only useful when it's for your survival it's only useful for survival and yet it goes off 30 40 times a day the alarm rings dozens of times a day and it not once was it ever a real survival issue yeah we think it's normal to feel fear for many things when it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. So when you begin to see those things, you can start paying attention to it. That's the way to learn to be fearless is by seeing the fear that we have is worthless, useless. There's nothing here to be afraid of. So instead of following the fear into jealousy, we can just stay with the fear. Oh, I feel good right now. I see them over there. They'll be OK. No problem. But we have to practice that. In seclusion. Because things are happening in the real world so fast that if we don't have that training in seclusion, in other words, when we're out in the world, the music plays at full speed, mistakes and all. We need to get away from of the performance of the piece, mistakes and all, into seclusion so we can slow it 
down and do it step by step and get it right and do that over and over and over and over again like in karate taking the arm and doing that then taking the arm and doing that and then pretty soon when somebody sticks a gun in your face you just broke his arm <laughs> because you've got it up to speed and you know exactly where you're going to hit his wrist with this forearm right here. And when you hit his wrist with a gun in it, with your uh, heavy duty like that, and you do it up to full speed, that gun's going to fly out right out of his hands. That's just in the movies, though. Smart people always keep their distance. Right, exactly, exactly. But stupid people <laughs> are the ones who get the gun knocked out of their hand. <laughs> or if he's punching at you, that's the same thing. And so we have to train slowly to get it up to speed. Now, in our lifetimes, we don't have a lot of guns or fists in our face, and so that's not really the training that we need to do. But the slings and arrows of outrageous behaviors are in our face all the time on a regular basis. But that doesn't mean that we have to respond to that stuff with fear. We can respond to it instead with loving kindness. We can respond with joy. If we can remember, if we've practiced to remember so that we can do it up to speed, we have to practice it slowly over and over and over again. So practice being joyful, practice being fearless, practice feeling safe, practice feeling secure, practice being comfortable, practice being satisfied. And if you keep practicing being satisfied in a slow, methodical way over and over again, then that begins to program that uh, automatic instinct so that it comes up with joy rather than terror. Instantaneously. We can reprogram. And so this is how we do it. We need that seclusion. And, and so sometimes when we are in a state of danger with somebody, the right thing to do is, well, I need some seclusion right now. I got to go try to take a, a bath or I'm going to go to the toilet or I'll just check you later or I'm, uh, let me get you another drink or all kinds of stuff just to get out of it. Little white lies so that you can uh, um, at least save him from beating you up <laughs> because you said something stupid because you were afraid of him or jealous of him or whatever, right? So there are times when we do want to take a hike to get out of it because we're, we recognize we're smart enough or let us say that we're uh, well-skilled enough to know that we can't handle this right now. And so now is the time to leave. Let's go in seclusion, get some practice again, come back, and this time we can handle it. And so that that in and out or that back and forth is something that every one of us has to do. Even people who become ordained, they don't stay in the back of the watt in seclusion all the time. They got to come up to the front of the watt and deal with lay people and realities. And so we can't say that the seclusion is ordination. Ordination is not the seclusion. Ordination only gives us the availability of seclusion, but you're, the availability of seclusion is there in your lay life. I mean, you're in a room by yourself already. You were able to shut the door and become secluded from the dogs. So that's the way of practice is to take more and more time in seclusion to practice slowing things down and taking a really close look at how we feel moment by moment, knowing that we can change it. We have something to say about the way we feel. And so we talk ourselves into feeling really good. I can handle this.
so I think this is probably a pretty good finishing point. I think that we've gotten something here that we can work with. Thank you very much with. for your time. Mm. Excuse me. All right, Eric. Well, we'll see you later. See you later. Uh, I'll try to log in on Friday. OK, I'll see you on Friday then. Bye. Thank you. OK, bye bye.